Alright folks, chapter 4, troubleshooting skills. This could either be the longest lecture we ever had or maybe the shortest, we'll see. Alright, so there's the objectives, blah 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 blah. And then troubleshooting, what is troubleshooting? How do you troubleshoot? Is it a step-by-step -step process? Is it an iterative process? Is it a scientific process? Is it a creative process? I can safely say years ago somebody told me that if you have knowledge of something and you understand how it works then you have power over it and that'll probably be the the number one help to your troubleshooting is knowledge about how something works once you know how a laser printer works and how it pulls the paper and which roller pushes the paper uh, and then how it uh, grabs the uh, the toner and how everything that they show you like I don't know if you've ever studied for net plus they used to make you um, memorize like the positive corona the negative corona and then the, the photosensitive drum all that stuff is built into the toner cartridge itself and then there's a heating unit in the back uh, and then the paper spits out so once you know how everything works if the toner is not sticking to the paper the heating unit's probably bad if the paper is getting too hot or not hot at all when it comes out uh, it's probably the heating unit uh, if the toner is scratchy and it sums here and sums not there, um, it could be the photosensitive drum. So once you know how things work, it's a lot easier to diagnose problems. You can also safely say nobody wants to hire a person who cannot troubleshoot. Um, I mean, why not just hire your mom there? I mean, my mom can answer the phone and be really nice and talk to people and get them to bring their computers in so somebody else can fix it. So why hire you? Because <laughs> my mom will work cheap. <laughs> I really shouldn't go there. All right, I digress. So as a help desk person, everybody that comes in expects you to be able to solve their problem. And again, like I've said before, if you don't know how to solve their problem, don't tell them you don't know. I don't care what the book says. You know, I mean, if, if the doctor's operating on you and you're away because he gave you maybe a local and he says, what the heck is that? And he's like, got like you open and he's inside your ribcage. That's not something you want to deal with. So nobody wants to come in and bring their computer and have the IT guy go, well, I got no idea what's wrong. It's like, oh, you're like, oh, oh. now the guy's going to experiment. So you want to say, you know, it could be a couple different things. Let me gather more information or let me troubleshoot a little bit more to kind of narrow it down. So the slides talk about a step-by-step -step process versus an iterative process. And here's kind of an example of that. In a step-by-step -step process or a sequential solving problem process, um, you collect information to clarify the problem and especially when you're dealing with users that can be the hardest thing because like when they call you on the phone they lie they don't intentionally lie I don't think well most of them don't but they have no idea what they're saying they'll tell you oh nobody down here can get email and really it's only like one person can't get email well nobody can get to the internet well there's one website they're trying to get to that they can't get to so you get that. So then consider alternative explanations, formulate a hypothesis, test the hypothesis. That's sequential problem solving. Where the interiv or the interiv, or, oh my gosh, I'm gonna go cry. So you collect information, you consider alternative explanations, and then you kind of like work kind of in a loop, and you kind of keep going. So in a sequential, you have to you you find the problem, you analyze the results, and really they're almost like the exact same thing. They have the exact same steps. The iterative though, you're kind of going at it and you're solving multiple problems. It could be, maybe it's the cable, maybe it's this, maybe it's that, maybe it's this. So you really don't spend enough time in the first step to get enough information to be able to actually solve the problem. You're just kind of like just shooting it at straws. Hey, okay, maybe it's the cable. All right, maybe it's the plug. All right, maybe it's the receptacle. Maybe it's the toner cartridge. Stuff like that. We used to call that the shotgun approach, and that is not where you want to be. Those are the guys, that when they're at the help desk and they're, they're doing that stuff, the other help desk guys pick up on that, and then they start giving you stupid things to look for. Hey, look for the squelch setting on the NIC card, or just something stupid. You know, you're trying to solve a printer issue, and we'll be like, "Hey, make sure that browser driver's right," because I've had that issue before where the browser driver wasn't right, and you and it caused screwed up the printing. And then the guy's like, "Oh, okay, that sounds good. <laughs> okay, there's no such thing as a browser driver, FYI." All right, moving on. So their idea is um, for this repetitive process or the iterative process, um, it creates flexibility, solves several blah blah blah. Um, they're saying it avoids a hit or miss trial and error approach, but that's really kind of what they're asking you to do. 
usually the first thing you want to do, especially if you have access to the user, like if I was a help desk guy and somebody called and said, oh, we're all down, you know, the internet's down. First thing I would do is I would try internet at my desk. And then I would say, okay, well, the internet works, so it must be them. Then I would run down to the department or I'd ask some questions, you know, hey, can, can somebody else beside you get to the internet? Oh, your neighbor can? Okay, so what website are you trying to go to? And then I would try to go to that website to see if maybe it's the website. Um, so by asking good questions at the start, you can really narrow it down to find out what the problem is. All right, so there are thinking skills. We have problem solving, we have critical thinking, and we have decision making. Problem solving is the process that moves from the current state of the problem to the desired state, um, the goal. So the objective to problem solving is getting from a problem to the desired state quickly, accurately, effectively, efficiently. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Just terrible book stuff. All right. So to put this in real world terms, what they're saying is you need to get the user up and running as fast as possible. Um, the help desk where I was at, we had extra PCs. Uh, we had a shelf. There were always five PCs set up ready to go. Everybody's documents were stored in their home folder, which was on a server. Everybody's email was on the server. So we would go to a desk, and if we could not solve the problem within 15 minutes, um, we would just run and go grab them a new computer, pop it in. We would set up their home folder and their email. They would be back, you know, pro being productive within 20 minutes, and then we could go take the PC back to our desk and then troubleshoot it. Nowadays, with virtual software, we don't even have to do that. We can just push down a new virtual machine because it's all in software. So if for some reason their virtual machine that they boot into gets corruptive, um, they can just call the help desk. You can be like, oh, well, hold on a sec, blah, blah, blah. And while well, this is downloading, you know, and you can just start talking about the problem, uh, and you're pushing them out a new file. So you really don't care. You just have them talking so that they're not bored to death. And the next thing you know, like five seconds, well, let's say five, but let's say five or ten minutes later, um, hey, it's all downloaded. I need to reboot your computer. Oh, is it working out? Great. All right, I fixed your problem. You're all set. And really all you did was just push down a new virtual machine. So you didn't problem solve anything. <laughs> you just pushed them down a new file. But what the user doesn't know won't hurt him. All right, so they give you this problem-solving model. Um, hey, obviously the, the printer doesn't work, so that's the current state. Um, so is it out of paper? Uh, is there a paper jam? Is there a bad cable? Um, and then, oh, it's a bad cable. And then you, you oh, the goal, uh, I found about what it was. But is that not like a shotgun approach? Oh, well, let me check the paper. Oh, let me check if there's a jam. Oh, let me go check the cable. Oh, let me check to make sure it's got power. That kind of, oh, make sure there's a toner cartridge in there. You will also sometimes have some very cruel users. I don't know if this is really a thing nowadays, um, but in the hospital where I was at, uh, there were a couple nurses that had dated some of the help desk guys, and <laughs> there was some ill feelings. And what they would do is they would open up the printer and pull the toner cartridge out or pull an ink cartridge out um, and then hide it and then uh, wait for somebody to call the help desk and go, hey, my printer's not working. Uh, and then the IT guy would come and he'd be troubleshooting, you know, for 20 minutes. Um, and really the thing would do was just out of what uh, toner. So that would really make the guy look bad. But you get the idea. All right, so problem analysis, we look for analogies. How is this problem similar to another? Uh, or contradictions. Two facts cannot be true at the same time. So if the power light's on in your printer, chances are it's not a bad power cable. All right, critical thinking describes cognitive skill used to analyze a problem. This is typically where most help desk guys struggle in their first year. They don't understand how to question the user. We used to have a, a slow, like the, the five question limit, and like you always had to ask at least five questions, um, which would help because that way when somebody says, Hey, I can't get to the internet, you would not, oh, oh let me write you a ticket real quick. Oh, user can't get to the internet. And then the, the network guy gets it and he calls the user, and it's just she was typing in the wrong URL. And then he thinks that the help desk guy that put that ticket in was an idiot. So don't be that guy. So we always had a, a five question minimum. So the critical thinking part is also where your knowledge and understanding of how things work come into play. This is why typically um, people that have a degree, uh, at least an associate degree or higher, um, tend to move up through the organization faster because they're better at diagnosing problems because they understand how things work. They understand the OSI model and they know about these different layers and they know switches work here uh, and routers work here. They understand that MAC addresses work at layer two. So if there's a MAC address issue, then it's probably a switch. If it's an IP address issue, it's probably a router. Um, if it's a port issue, it's probably a firewall, that kind of stuff. 
Uh, they understand IP math. They can look at two different um, IP addresses and realize whether they're in the same network, where a lot of your homegrown networking guys have never been exposed to that kind of knowledge. Uh, they have no idea how IP math works. They just know that, oh, this is my IP address. Here's how I find my IP address. Here's what the IP address of everything is. But I have no idea how the IP address thing works. And I kid you not, I know <laughs> guys making $80,000 in network administrators that have no idea how IP math works. But I'll move on. So a mental model, um, a conceptual picture to help you understand how something works. You know, when somebody can't ping somebody, um, I know that, hey, there's obviously an issue on my network. So is it the cable? Is it the NIC card? So I'll start testing the closest point first and then keep testing further and further out to see where the problem is. And then um, a hypothesis testing is you make a guess or a prediction and then you try to prove or disprove it. Oh, I think it's a network cable. Let me go get one. All right, well, that didn't work. Uh, maybe that's the NIC card. Let me go pop a new one in, that kind of stuff. So creativity, the ability to find a novel or innovative solution to a problem. You're going to see some weird stuff out there. Give an example. We had thin clients. And a thin client is just like a little box with a, um, some memory in there. And when you boot it up, um, it has like a little ROM chip, and it boots up into kind of its own operating system. And then it looks for, um, if it, it points to a server, and it actually runs the operating system and stuff off of the server. This way, whenever I need to, I don't, I never have to replace PCs. I just have to replace the, the the server and maybe get a bigger or faster server. But we had thin clients, and every once in a while, like when there was an electrical storm or, or some something weird would happen, especially with the North Kent power grid because it's always funky, they would die. Well, not all of them, but you know, a couple of them would just die, and we couldn't get them to turn back on. We could put a new power cord in there. And then they would work, but the old power cord we had was like, okay, this is shot, we need to send it back. Well, these power cords were $80 because, you know, they went to a brick. Well, one guy, and I don't know if this was creativity because it really wasn't creative, but he was underneath the desk and he was, um, take, he knew it was the power cord. He accidentally dropped it and then he plugged it back in for some reason, then it worked. So we realized what was happening was with these power bricks, something was getting jammed up inside those as far as electricity goes and they wouldn't work anymore so all we had to do was take it and just like kind of take the brick in your one hand and kind of tap it um, to your other hand and that would like fix it so that saved us like I'm, I'm not kidding you every week or two um, we would have two or three of those that would die and then we would send somebody out and he would just tap them or we would have the we had the nurses do that and they thought we were crazy but it worked and they were like oh my gosh you gotta be kidding me nope <laughs> All right, and then they mentioned uh, metacognition, the ability to step back from a problem and think about your own problem-solving thought process. You're going to see some terrible th think processes out there, or thought processes, how you want to say that. I worked at a place, and I got hired in, and within two weeks, I had to go to training up in Cleveland for something. So um, I met the guy that, that was my assistant, and he was the network administrator, and I was the, the, like the director, or the, the then they called it something else, the uh, telecommunications administrator. Anyway, <clears throat> so there were two buildings. All the servers were in building A, uh, and then everybody, there were like 50 users in building A. And then there were like 100 users over in building B. And then there was a, a fiber line that connected building B to building A so they could access all the resources. Well, the first day I was in Cleveland for my class, um, I get a call from the guy and um, he's like dude he's like everything's all down like, I don't understand what's going on and I'm like well tell me you know what happened tell me what happened first he's like well I lost building B nobody in building B could access the internet I'm like okay so what did you do to fix that and he's like well uh, I rebooted all the servers I'm like wait a minute so you took building A down by rebuilding by rebooting all the servers to fix building B <laughs> so that was his thought process I should just go rebuild or reboot all the servers so some people have some very terrible problem-solving processes. And it's usually when we don't know that we get scared and we start doing crazy stuff. So before doing anything, you know, think about the assumptions you're making. Um, and here they talk about, you know, where did I go wrong in my approach? And really, at the end of each week, uh, and typically like on Fridays, um, I used to love, and it was like always after lunch, I would always schedule like a half-hour block. Um, and then I would sit in my office and I would like think think of all the things I did this week that I thought I could do better, uh, and then where I thought I might have gone wrong. And then I would write that stuff down so that when I come in the next week on Monday, um, I would try to do have a better week. 
if you're at a company and you get Dell machines, Dell PCs, um, you should start studying the information about the the, bump, the excuse me the model of uh, Dell that you buy. If you get an Exchange server, you should start studying Exchange. Most people make mistakes when obviously when they don't understand that what they're working on. All right, then decision making, the ability to make good decisions. It may sound easy, but it's a lot harder to, uh, when you get out there in the real world uh, and you have to make choices. All right, so troubleshooting skills, uh, communication skills, obviously is a big one. So basic listening uh, or reading skills. You know, a lot of us like to just skim stuff, um, that kind of thing. Active listening. Let the user finish, even if if somewhere in the first minute they gave you the information you need. Let the user finish. Nobody likes to be interrupted. Um, probes. <laughs> I'm so immature. You know, ask probing questions. Um, you know, when I when I anytime I'd go to a user's desk um, for a call, the very first thing I would say is, "Can you show? Can you duplicate the problem?" And nine times out of ten, that gave me all the information I needed. Most help desks today have the ability to remote in to the users. So when the user calls you, you can just remote in and say, okay, now show me what you were doing. Can you duplicate the problem? And then that will answer most of your questions. Um, ask critical questions. Oh, every, the Internet's down here for everybody. All right, so everybody down there can't get the Internet? You know, can you, So ask what's her name beside you. Can she get the Internet? What website are you trying to go to? Because the Internet's working for me. That kind of stuff. And then explanations, verification, you get the idea. All right, so troubleshooting with communication skills, you know, to get a basic description of the problem, um, which most users are going to call them. They're going to kind of give you that basic description. So we also need um, to learn the user's perspective on the problem. Oh, the whole Internet's down. No, the whole Internet's not down. You only typed in one website. You know, you can't just go to www.hotchicks all the time and expect that website to work. Uh, <laughs> we need to probe for additional information. What website are you going to? Can the person beside you get to the internet? What browser are you using? Did you download Chrome again? <laughs> All right, and then uh, we learn these skills to effectively communicate a solution back to the user. Uh, so we want to make sure that we're not using jargon. Uh, we're talking just like a, a regular person. Oh, okay, here's what it is. Uh, you're all fixed. Have a great day. That kind of stuff. All right, basic listening skills. You know, the big thing is let the user talk, uh, even if they're rambling. Um, sometimes you kind of like have to start chuckling and like, all right, oh, let me stop, oh, oh, slow down. Um, if they go too fast or if, if, they're, if they're being excessive, you know, if, if the conversation turns to, hey, you got a girlfriend, that kind of stuff. You know, you, you'll have to learn how to curb that kind of the issue. Um, but again, let the user talk. Look for what they're saying. What can I get to? Um, if they say, well, when I do this, this happens. Uh, so those critical pieces that you're trying to grab. Active listening. Keep eye contact with the user. Listen to what they're saying. Don't be drifting off and staring at the keyboard and, and doing stuff on the keyboard and, and monitor, and you're totally ignoring the user behind you talking to you. Don't be standing above the user and trying to peek down their shirt and other weird stuff. All right, paraphrasing. So it's a good idea that like when the user's done talking, to kind of paraphrase what they did. So they'll say, oh, you know, the, the whole internet's down for everybody, and I, we can't get to any internet site. All right, so you're telling me that you've tried multiple uh, internet sites and none of that working. Is that correct? So that that would be paraphrasing. And then probing questions for more information. Uh, when your computer crashes, is it always running the same program, or is it, or is it when, when you when you're on different programs? Uh, is it always when you bring up the medical record system? Is it always when you bring up the radiology system? What were you running when it went down? Um, you know, has it done this before? Um, have Nancy beside you bring up that program and see if hers crashes. Let's crash them all! Ray! All right, critical questions. When the user starts troubleshooting their stuff. Um, oh, this is crazy, you know, radiology program you have that's screwed up my computer. Um, that's when you have to kind of get in there and start asking focused, critical questions about, you know, are you sure it's the radiology system? Tell me what happens. What other programs do this? Um, you know, is anybody else having a, the same problem? Or, oh, Nancy is? Well, let me talk to Nancy for a minute. Um, <laughs> you might get more answers out of Nancy. All right, your book says there are five critical questions. Has this system or component or feature ever worked? Oh, I downloaded some new software and it won't run. 
Well, when you download it, did it ever run? Well, no. Where'd you download it from? Oh, this cool website about hot chicks. <laughs> that's, that's always a bad sign. All right, next one. Have you ever had this problem before? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm so immature. You know, a better question might be, you know, how often uh, ha has this been happening to you? Oh, my PC locked up. Um, you know, has your PC locked up before? Um, stuff like that. Uh, can the problem be replicated? You know, can you do it again? If I come down there, can you show it to me? Can you show me the error? Uh, and then what were you doing just before you noticed the problem? Uh, oh, you know, every time I get into Word, blah, 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 that happens. Uh, what were you running before Word? Or what were you doing? Um, and, or have you ever made any recent hardware or software changes? Now, in most companies, the user is not permitted to install any software on their PC. They're not permitted to do updates or anything like that. In most companies with 50 or more PCs, you know, the IT guy creates the the Windows Update server. He approves updates and he sends those and enforces those out automatically. He's the one that decides what software gets installed, what drivers get installed. But you will have users that will just never be satisfied. Oh, well, I put some seat cleaner on there to clean that crap on my PC. And my PC was running slow, so I put like five Windows optimizers on there. That sucker runs good now. Those are always the people where you just cringe when they call. Because it's never the things they did. They All the crap that they did has actually improved performance. But the crap you did slowed their PC down and gave it viruses. Um, but you get the idea. Alright, then the explanations. You know, you always want to leave the user, you know, especially after you fix a problem, you want to give them some kind of explanation. Oh, well, it was this or it was that. Sometimes if you don't know what the explanation was, um, you, you've got to kind of walk around that. And you never want to tell them you didn't know. Because, uh, like, sometimes I've sat down at the desk um, and I've touched a couple buttons and, and just looked at some stuff, and all of a sudden everything started working again and it was fine. Um, that's just kind of a Windows thing. And that's just something you're going to have to work with. Um, but something else that you need to keep in mind is anytime there's an issue or a problem, uh, and it's a new problem you haven't seen before, or some, and you've talked to some other guys at the help desk and they've never seen it before, um, you want to have some kind of solution database. Like most help desk software allows you to put in, um, you know, here's what the problem was, the radiology system was doing this. Or every time the user um, tried to open uh, Chrome uh, and open the VPN software, they got this. Um, most of these software allow you to um, create a solution database. You can just type in, you know, um, Chrome VPN and software issue. Um, and then, boom, somebody else who solved that issue will kind of pop up. All right, and then verify. Never, ever, ever leave the user without asking, you know, um, are, are you okay now? Does everything seem to be working? Um, are you satisfied? Something like that. You want to get that verification from the user so that they communicate to you that, that it has been resolved to their satisfaction. You don't ever want to say, oh, it's all fixed, see you later, and then leave. Because then they're gonna something's going to happen and then they're not going to be satisfied. You always want to make sure, like if it's a printer issue, you want to make sure the user prints before you leave. With every new IT guy that I've ever had at the help desk, uh, I've seen this over and over again. Somebody has a printer issue, he goes out, he fixes the printer, he prints a test page from the printer itself so the printer works, then he comes back, and then the user calls again and says, I still can't print. Because the user was not pointed to the printer. So whatever printer problem he thought he was solving, he was not solving their problem. So you always want to have the user um, hey, is it, is it working now? Hold on, let me try. Oh, no, I still can't print. You don't want repeat business at the help desk, okay? That's bad at the help desk. All right, so information resources, obviously personal experience, nothing beats it. A lot of the more organized places have scripts or checklists uh, for the help desk, so the help desk person has a script. He'll ask the specific questions. Check this, check this, check this, check this. Um, you know, did you do this? All right, can I have you do this? Um, or they can have a checklist. All right, man, I need you to check this. I need you to check that. That kind of stuff. Um, most places have knowledge bases. You know, Microsoft has a knowledge base. Cisco has a knowledge base. Any, most of these companies have knowledge bases. Coworkers, put the user on hold. Yo, everybody, help desk. What up? I'm going. I got this problem. Fix it. What? What am I doing? 
and they talk about other professional contacts. Uh, I'm not going to lie to you. Every good help desk or IT guy that I know, he is a member of several um, technical forums, and when he has a problem that he can't solve, he posts in the forums. I can't tell you how many times I have posted in the official Cisco forums about issues that I've had, got the answer, fixed it, and I'm like, woohoo, look what I did! And everybody's like, oh, you the man! <laughs> that kind of crap. All right, and then the support vendors. You know, if you've got a vendor um, that you work heavily with, you know, if you order a lot of IBM servers, things like that, like at, at Stark State, at the college, uh, we actually they actually have a Dell representative because they they're all Dell on their um, switching, uh, and their PCs are all Dell. So they actually have a Dell guy who comes out, you know, once a month or whatever, and talks to them and offers support and that kind of stuff. Uh, and then sometimes there's an escalation team that you can escalate issues to. Um, well, well, actually, most places, you know, if you're tier one, you can escalate to tier two or tier three, things like that. All right, again, personal experience is the bomb. Nothing's going to make up for that. And you only get personal experience by doing it, by being there, by, you know, looking at more issues. Um, hiding at the help desk and only answering phone calls and, and talking in the script and entering tickets um, does not really build up your experience. You need to be out there fixing things. Volunteer for crappy jobs. Um, that was really kind of like for me, like I, when I was at the help desk, you know, I just, people would call and I would like write tickets. And then my, my desk was right outside like the network guy and I would see, always see him changing tapes in the server room. I'd be like, hey dude, you know, if you show me how to do that, I'd do tapes for you. Um, he's like, really? And then, and then I started doing tapes. And once he saw that I was doing the tapes and I was doing them accurately and I was actually checking the logs and flipping the tapes and doing that stuff, um, then he had more faith in me, and then he started showing me other stuff, and that's where I got into Cisco and that kind of thing. So don't be afraid to volunteer for crappy jobs. Um, I'll go bring in those 12 computers or whatever you need. Um, hey, let me have a look at that issue. You have to build up that personal experience. You can't be afraid of problems. You need to be, hey, I need to jump into that problem. I need to fix that so I can learn how to do that stuff. All right, the scripts and checklists we are talked about, uh, they also show you um, figure 4 or 5 on page 153 has an example. Um, knowledge bases we kind of already talked about, um, and then all kinds of stuff. Well, especially nowadays, you know, back in the early '80s, beginning of the, or yeah, beginning of the '90s, uh, there was not as much stuff as there is now. Um, and the internet used to pay per hour; it was like two ninety nine. Um, so nowadays, woo, you guys got it great. All right, search engine guidelines, blah. Uh, but I will tell you, you need to get your Google foo up. As an IT person, you need to be a black belt in Google Foo. You can't just type in, oh, Dell computer not working, and <laughs> get an answer. You need to learn how to use Google. All right, this web page is kind of dying on me, and I don't know what, what's going on. But anyway, um, there are specific ways that you can search Google. You can actually type in file type colon PDF space the dot, what you're kind of looking for, airspeed, uh, and then in title colon velocity of a swallow. So you don't just type in, you know, what's the, what is the air speed velocity of a swallow. Um, you can get very specific with some of these searches. So that's what we mean by Google flu. You know, you're a master of looking up things on Google that other people just can't find because other people just type in random stuff in Google and hope it, you know, oh, it's not on the first three, so I need to you change my search, that kind of stuff. So just bring up Google and <laughs> type in Google Foo or, you know, ways to effectively use Google. Um, they actually have a lot of books out there uh, about uh, searching. Uh, and, and most of them are like, like 12 bucks where you can buy a small paperback of, you know, 86 pages that just goes into Google. All right. Other contacts, coworkers, um, news groups, RSS feeds, eh, social media, really. You want to get a, uh, be a part of uh, several tech forums. Um, Tech Tips is a big one. Let me show you that real quick. This is a site I stumbled onto years and years and years ago. Um, it's TEK-Tips, so Tech Tips. So whatever you're looking for, uh, they typically have a forum for it. So let's look for, uh, stop the script. So let's say I'm having a problem with my Cisco router, so I want to click here. So when I click on Cisco routers, you know, I can, obviously if I had an account, I could post my issue. Um, I could go and look at their fact sheets that they have on Cisco. Give me a sec for this to open. 
All right, but you get the idea. So there's a bunch of forums out there for different things. You know, if you're the server guy, you want to be a part of maybe Dell's official forum, if that's your hardware. You want to be on a, a Microsoft forum or two for the server software you're using. Um, you want to make sure that you're getting the latest updates from Microsoft. You want to know what all the updates are, uh, what new viruses are coming out, that kind of stuff. So make sure you're getting new stuff in. You know what's what are the latest patches and what are they fixing, um, as well as being a part of different tech forums um, to solve your different issues. So again, vendor support. You know most places. You know if you buy a considerable amount of info, uh, hardware or software from a vendor, um, you can always go to your your software guy or your sales guy and ask him questions. You know, as the director of IT, I got so lazy that near the end there, um, I wouldn't even research a new server. If I needed a new server, I would just call my guy at, at CDW, who I had a really good relationship with, and I'd be like, "Hey, put me in, put me into your um, uh, HP server guy," and then he would put transfer me to a guy that was trained in HP. Um, servers, and I would say, "Hey, I need a server. It's got to support this many people." Um, and then he would quote me exactly what I needed. So I was—that's all I had to tell him was how many people were going to be on that server at one time. All right, and then obviously there's typically an escalation team. Where do I go if I don't know the answer? All right, diagnostic and repair tool. Windows surprisingly has a lot of diagnostic and repair tools that most people don't realize. Um, and if you take the A plus class, the PC maintenance and repair. Uh, they'll kind of walk you through some of those here, or some of those. Uh, most vendors typically have some kind of software. Like if you buy a motherboard from ASUS, um, you can actually go to ASUS's website and they have some diagnostic software to help you. Uh, if you buy memory from uh, Crucial, uh, they have memory testing software in addition to the stuff that Microsoft has. So every company has some kind of diagnostic software for their hardware. All right, and then there's remote access tools, um, log me in, go to my PC. Um, I don't know what the pricing model for that stuff is. You used to be able to get one or two accounts for free. Um, then you had to pay for mo more than five or things like that. Um, PC Anywhere is not really used as much anymore out in the, in the real world. Um, uh, but log me in and go to my PC. Oh, every, everybody's using those. Um, you know, we had a, a big contract with log me in so that myself and the two other network guys um, from anywhere, we could go to logmein.com, log in with our username and password, and then we would then have access to all of our servers remotely. Oh, and more, if you've never seen log me in or go to my PC.com, um, Basically, they're websites where you go to the website, like let's say I'm a server administrator. Um, from my servers, I go to those websites and I install a small little app, uh, and then that registers that server onto their site, and after I've set up my username and password, you know, then I set that stuff up. So then I can be anywhere in the world, and I can just go to go to mypc.com, uh, and then when I log in with my username and password, uh, it'll then allow me to access rem or to remote access you know, my servers. So they're really slick. Um, goes right through firewalls and all that stuff. You don't have to set anything up. Um, you just have to, like, if you're a home user, from your home PC, you need to go there, create the account, and then add the PC. You have to sit at the desk of the PC that you want to remote into um, to get that set up. And again, all it is is you just download a file, and then you run the file. And then, boom, it's that simple. And then you can go, you can come here to Stark State, and then if you ever need to access your PC, you can just access your PC. Obviously, you have to leave your PC on, but we, you get the idea. So if you've never seen those two sites, um, go check them out. Try the free trial just to see what it's like because um, it's pretty slick. All right, there's other stuff, PC diagnostics, PC doctor, PC bit stuff. I'm not a big fan of really any kind of diagnostic software like this. Um, usually between Windows and the vendor stuff, uh, you get almost everything you need. Uh, you should be able to detect any hardware or software issue. Most of the time, you can kind of figure out what the problem is just by what it's doing. If the PC won't turn on at all and nothing spins, in the, you know it's the power supply because nothing's getting power. If it's constantly crashing, it could be a CPU issue, or it could be a memory issue, um, or it could be a hard drive issue. Um, install a new operating system. Well, hey, that didn't do it, so it's got to be the memory or something like that. Um, there are mem tests that you can just download from Microsoft um, where you just reboot your PC and put the CD in, and it'll test your memory. Um, your, your, your regular Windows installations will do that stuff. So I'm not a big fan of third-party tools, only because most of them are free, and in order to be free, they also install crappy software on your PC. 
Like now, if you try to download the Flash player, it always tries to install um, like the McAfee stuff. Um, uh, oh, here's the 30-day trial of this. So, and all these tools, like when you install them, there'll be some windows. So if you start clicking through really fast, you won't even see it, where they want to install some crap on your PC. So I tend to stay away from that stuff. All right, software stuff. They have registry mechanic. Um, C cleaner is really the only thing you need. You know, C cleaner. It's just a C and then cleaner. Um, and the C, the first C stands for crap, so crap cleaner. Um, <clears throat> it's probably the best one you can get. Um, it'll actually back up your registry, things like that, and it's very easy to use. Um, and that's probably the only one that I recommend. All right, network problems. Um, every network card um, has a bunch of uh, different utilities built into it. Um, there are a ton of different network diagnostic utilities. Most of the time, you just want to see what kind of bandwidth is going through your NIC card. Um, and you want to be able to ping your NIC card. So ping, you know, 127 dot something dot something dot something to make sure your NIC card's responding. If it is responding, uh, you want to put some kind of um, flow control or something on there where you can actually watch the, the bandwidth being utilized. Uh, is, is something choking it off? Is my network card, you know, acting erratically? Things like that. A lot of times you can just download a big file uh, and then just watch the bandwidth and, and see what's going on. You know, you can go to Task Manager. So go to your taskbar, right-click, Task Manager, hit Performance, uh, and you can see how you know what bandwidth is going through right now. So obviously, I'm not pushing a whole. I'm not I'm pushing zero kilobits. Woo, nothing. Um, so start downloading a file or something like that, and then watch your your bandwidth utilization. Um, it should be relatively steady. There's always going to be some peaks and valleys, um, but you shouldn't see radical stuff uh, going on. All right, problem solving strategies, uh, look for a simple, obvious solution, uh, attempt to replicate the problem, uh, examine the configuration, initiate a root cause, you, but you get the idea. So that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, look for a simple, obvious, a lot of guys go in and they start thinking of, oh, it's got to be the most complicated issue. Uh, and they start at the hardest thing first. You always want to start at the simple stuff. Um, had an IT guy, and he was a really good IT guy. And somebody had a problem with a PC or, or a piece of equipment. I don't remember what it was. Probably a printer. And he went and he starts troubleshooting it. And five minutes later, one of the users said, "Oh, hey, this thing's not plugged in." And they plugged it in, and then everything worked. And then he looked like a dick. Well, I'm gonna say don't, but I didn't say that. Something else. He looked bad. And like even a year later, people would still bring that up. Oh, I don't want so and so to come out and look at my PC because you know he doesn't even check the cables or something like that. Um, but the guy was actually really good. I mean, he just uh, and that that could have happened to anybody. So always make sure that you check the the basic stuff first, um, especially in the work environment. You know, a lot of times these things are all jammed together behind the monitor and you get a bunch of plugs jamming in and sometimes you put the the power breaker switch behind there uh, and it's very easy for somebody to accidentally turn that breaker switch off um, on the power strip uh, and that turns everything off and then they or it could be the cleaning person they're in the back they're dusting they accidentally hit the little uh, little switch on the, the power strip nobody even notices they come in oh my PC's dead I gotta call the IT to the help desk guys help desk guy comes out he's troubleshooting oh it could be a power supply blah, blah, blah. but and then you get the idea so always try to replicate the problem. That'll help you more than anything else. Um, if you're remoting in or you're standing right beside the person, say, "Hey, you know, can you duplicate the problem for me? Show me. Can you show me the problem? Show me how you did that." All right. Examine the configuration. Most places have a standardized configuration. Um, you know, the last thing you want to do is have 100 different configurations throughout your organization. Most people have standardized on a certain model of PC. Uh, and they, every three years they, they buy them. Like if you go to Stark State, almost every classroom has relatively the same PCs. Um, in each building, like the C building has all the same PCs. The K building has all the same PCs. The Mac Lab, they're all the same PCs. All right, so let's try to think of the root cause. What's causing this issue? I got a printer and nothing's printed. The pages are just coming out blank. What could cause that? I could be out of toner. Maybe somebody pulled the toner cartridge. Maybe the the fusing unit or the heating unit in the back um, is not putting enough heat on there, and the toner is all falling off before it comes out. So start with the toner thing. Let me go to the toner cartridge. I shake it. Uh, is anything in there? All right, let me put that back in there and try that again. Okay, hey, now I'm starting to see some, or I did, I'm still not seeing anything. 
let me pop in a new toner cartridge. Okay, hey, that seems to fix it. So this other toner cartridge, even though it has toner, is bad. And I can tell you, um, I have seen bad toner cartridges. You know, we're at the point now where anytime you buy a toner cartridge, nine times out of ten, it's refurbished. Um, we have places like Cartridge World and things like that, like Stark State uses. Every toner cartridge that we use, once it's done, we throw it in a bin, and Cartridge World comes and picks them up. And they reload those and repackage those. Every company does that, HP, whatever. Um, so a lot of times when you're getting these things back, they're reused. They just refill them and plug them back up, and they're all set. So they could be bad, and that company may not even know it. They're just filling them up and pushing them out there. So even though the thing is brand new, you still don't know. So don't assume that stuff. All right, so view a system as a group of subsystems. You know, when I look at a PC, um, I know that there's power going into that PC, and that's, that's one subsystem. Um, I know that there's a hard drive that actually stores the data. I know that when the, pro, when the PC is running, it actually stores data on, in the RAM, and that's what's, what I'm seeing. When I'm seeing Windows and stuff on my screen, that's all in RAM. Try to chase the, or uh, sorry, yeah, chase the problem or trace the problem. So, if the PC won't start, and I press the power button and the PC doesn't start, but lights are coming on and I'm seeing or I'm hearing the hard drive wind up, but nothing's coming on the screen, I know it's not a power issue because I'm seeing lights. Um, I'm hearing the hard drive spin up. Uh, maybe it's the monitor. Uh, maybe it's the the monitor driver. It's the video card in the PC. Um, so that's where I'll start. All right, module replacement strategy. Every company is most of the help desk out there. This is why they standardize on a product so that they can have extra parts. You know, we all have spare motherboards. We all have spare power supplies, things like that. So if we suspect something, we can replace it on the spot. If you suspect it's the video card, replace the video card uh, with a known good one. Now remember, I'm saying a known good one. You can't just grab ones from somewhere else and assume that it works because um, that's a road to failure. You know, the help desk where I was at, we always had a PC kind of sitting there with a, with the side off, and it was always running so that you knew it was working. Um, and then if you needed a video card, you always pulled the video card out of there because you knew that was working. Uh, that kind of stuff. All right. Um, you know, apply a hypothesis uh, testing approach. So try to troubleshoot as much as you can and then think what it could be. And then once, you're, once you've come up with your idea based on the information that you've got, uh, try to solve the problem. If you suspect it's a power issue, trace the power from the wall all the way to the PC. Um, a lot of times, uh, depending on the, the building, especially if you rent a building, these people that own these commercial buildings are cheap frickin' people. <laughs> they will skimp and have Joe Donut with a bunch of butt cracks sticking out uh, to all their electrical stuff. Uh, so a lot of times the, the wall jack will just go dead uh, because they didn't tighten a bolt or something or they used really crappy cheap wall sockets. So there's a little plug you can buy like at, at Lowe's or some Home Depot. They're like two or three bucks. Um, but it's just a plug that goes into a wall socket and tells you whether that wall socket is actually uh, applying power or applying power correctly. You don't need a voltmeter to test that. The last thing I want to do is take two metal probes and stick them into a, uh, an outlet, even though we do do that in the A-plus class. Um, I like the plug thing. It's in my little toolbox. It's really small. I just plug it in. Lights come up. Okay, I know the jack's good. All right, and I know your your standard power cable are typically good. Anytime there's a power brick involved, um, put your hands on the brick slowly because they could be hot, uh, and feel the brick. If the brick is excessively hot, it could be the power brick. Uh, if there's burn marks in the brick, it's the power brick. So, or it could be the, um, a lot of these power strips have breakers on them. Uh, and especially if you're in a business in North Canton, North Canton has a terrible power grid. I mean, they're always getting like um, br uh, brownouts and sags and, and spikes. Uh, that was a difficult problem when I was at the North Canton Medical Foundation that we were always dealing with. I don't know if it's gotten any better recently. Uh, but so sometimes you get a power strip and it actually has a breaker on there so that when a spike comes in, the breaker flips so it doesn't hurt your PC. But then the user just looks and the button is still, you know, the, the, the on off button is still lit because it's still receiving power. So you think, oh, it looks fine. But if you looked at the side, you would see that the breaker got tripped. So sometimes it's as easy as that. All right. So, you know, restore a basic configuration. If I'm working on somebody's wireless and I, and I can't get it to go, 
the first thing I do is I strip everything off of there. You know, I make sure that, like, let's say I'm in a home and, and we can't get their wireless to work. I go to the wireless access point and I set it up with a basic configuration. No security at all. No WEP, no WPA, and nothing. Uh, and then I try to get the client to connect that way. And if I can get them to connect that way, then I first, then I kind of step through the security. All right, let's turn on a web key. All right, let me turn on a web key on the computer. Okay, can I connect now? Yes. All right, let me do WPA. Okay, does that work? All right, now let me try WPA too. Um, so I'll slowly go through those steps. But I'll restore things to basics uh, configuration first. That way I can eliminate all the advanced stuff. Later on, um, as your career progresses uh, and you get into firewalls, uh, you'll find that's a common thing. When we're doing VPNs um, or we're restricting traffic or things on a firewall, sometimes what we'll do is we'll, we'll drop all security on the firewall, make sure we can get the user to connect and everything works, and then we slowly start implementing the security back on um, until we and then we find out like, oh, when I when I turned on this, now the user can't get back on. So that's what the issue might it has to be. And again, I'm not saying we do this in a live environment. You know, we typically do this, you know, we pull a firewall uh, in the lab and then we try to have the user connect to it, that kind of stuff. All right, the big thing is patience and persistence. Uh, you have to enjoy solving problems. You have to want to solve problems. Um, you have to be willing to work with all kinds of different people. You're going to work with fat people. You're going to work with skinny people. You're going to work with all kinds of different people people from ethical ba or ethnic backgrounds. You're going to work with girls, you're going to work with guys, you're going to work with old people, you're going to work with young people. So as the IT person, you're going to be a people person. Uh, so if you don't like dealing with that, you probably want to stay away from IT. Uh, go get into programming because then you can code, code in the basement and uh, you'll be fine. All right, and then make sure as an IT person, uh, your job never really stops. You're always learning. It's not like being an English professor where once you understand English, you're done learning and then the rest of your time is yours. Uh, you have to keep up on the industry. You know, what's going on with VMware? What's going on with that kind of stuff? So the patience and persistent thing are the big things. You know, when you get to a user's desk or uh, something comes in and you don't know how to fix it, um, stop, think about what you're doing, try to isolate the problem the best you can. And then if you don't know what to do, then go to, especially like when you're new to a help desk, go to one of the senior guys and say, or, you know, somebody else at the help desk and say, hey, I think it's this. How do I test that? Or I think it's this. Have you ever seen that before? Or can you come help me with that? Most places when you first get hired, like I know when you get hired at Time Warner Cable, uh, they have like a two-month training program that they put everybody through, regardless of your experience. You can have a bachelor's degree and be the best problem solver ever, uh, and they still make you go through the training. All right, so develop your own approach. What works for you? Again, the best thing, don't be afraid of problems. Um, be ready to jump in, start solving things, learn, find resources for your specific company so you can get to there are some IT guys out there that like to hoard their resources um, and not show anybody where they're getting their answers from, which I've never really understood. Uh, I guess they feel that they'll move up faster if they can solve problems and nobody else can. Um, but don't be like that. Always share the stuff that you learn um, with everybody else, um, and then more people will want to work with you. And when it gets time to get promoted, people want to work. People do things with people they know and like. Uh, and actually, that's the number one rule of business. People do business with people they know and like. So if nobody likes that guy because he's selfish, it doesn't matter how good he is, um, I'm going to pick somebody that I prefer that I can deal with that's going to be a good part of my team. I can teach the technical skills. Anybody can teach you the technical skills. It's the people skills uh, that we really look for. All right, so that wraps up this big old chapter. Woo, and there's a big old summary. And look at that there. <laughs> All right. So, again, if you have any questions, make sure you call or email me or something. Um, this online thing is all new to me. Uh, I'm, like, feeling weird because I don't have any face-to-face -face people to make fun of. Um, so if you have a problem, email me, and I'll make fun of you, and we'll go from there. All right, guys, have a great week.